Good morning, Doug. Good morning, Gil. So yes, the financialization of everything. Yes, indeed. <laughs> well, Chauncey and I have been talking about that a lot. Yeah, it's it, and it's so hard to see a way out once you're into it as deeply as we are. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm loving Graeber. Yeah, isn't it, the book is wonderful. It, the book is wonderful at so many levels. And um, I, I saw one review before I started reading it that likened it to um, Darwin and Galileo. Yeah. In its, in its import and significance. I think it's, that might not be an overreach. I mean, the well, thing, it, it, thing it's significance. It's not written as tightly as Darwin, and well, uh, it's okay. Well, it's you know, it's it's well, it's fun. years, but but the 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 sense of possibility that it opens, uh, you know, to exactly the stuckness you're talking about. We're talking about the uh, Graeber Wengrow book, The Dawn of Everything, because um, for me, by by presenting the enormous variety of human experience. Um, and in and out and experimentation over, you know, tens of thousands of years, it says to me, there's not just one way to be or two ways to be, which we seem, we seem to be stuck in this world that seems to have no yep. exit. And that suggests, well, you know, we may not see the path, but we can start to see the possibility. Right. It, it certainly unfreezes the kind of lockstep logic that we've lived in. Yeah. And that's a tremendous gift. And the view that, uh, we think that the world went from simple hunter-gatherers to complex societies. He's saying, no, it's the other way around. The hunter-gatherers had a much more complicated life than we have. Yeah. And we've locked ourselves into a, a rigid structure that prevents freedom and quality of life. Well, that was a really happy place to drop into a conversation. Well timed, sir. Well timed. Yeah, yeah. Um, Good. That's everything, that, everything. talking about the Graeber book. Yeah, exactly. Everything you said, Doug. And then we'll call it the Graeber book, but it's the Graeber Wengrow book. Yes. yes. We got to give the other David some credit here because this came out of their 10 years of conversation. And he's still alive and he's really uh, smart. And so. Yeah. And they had two other books planned. So we'll see what Wengrow does with all that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And in, in case nobody's heard of it, um, I read Against the Grain a couple of years ago by James Scott, who's still alive yeah. and, and in New York. Uh, and I, I'm like, really want to meet him. I kind of want to interview him and talk about these things because he convinced me of this thesis uh, back then. Mm -hmm. And and Scott in his introduction explains that he's not an expert in any one of these things, but he took 10 years to write this book. And in the meantime, gave speeches, went and talked to the anthropologists and the sociologists and the paleontologists and everybody else um, and sort of vetted the thesis. So um, that's really super interesting. Jerry, do you know if Scott has reviewed this book yet? I'm sure he's, I, I don't know that he's written a review. He was quoted in one of the reviews I just uh, read, mm -hmm. which made me very happy. Um, and I think that he's in the bibliography of the book, but I'm not sure. Well, probably everybody is. It's got like, what, 80 pages. <laughs> That's true. That's true. It's a monster work. Yeah. I'm working from home tree today. Just Good. was lucky to find my way. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, there's kind of a bunch of OGME things to check in about. And Pete, I don't know if you'd like to have a go at talking a bit about uh, some of the stuff you've done, because I think it would be really nice for everybody here. And then I can talk a little bit about weaving the world and, and sort of status on that. And I can also report in on the story threading I did last week, which might be interesting. So I think there's a, a bunch of things we might hog the, the start of the call with for a sec. <clears throat> just to just I think it's also kind of uh, a good update for OGM. Uh, as we go. So do you want to kick us kick us off? Good call. I, I would love that. Thanks. Yay. Um, uh, Eric said something interesting at the or in the chat at the end of the last call. How do we, you know, how do we uh, harvest this and, and collect it? And so I took that as a challenge. Uh, um, and I said it would take many hours to do. And I foolishly thought it wouldn't take many hours to do afterwards. And it took many hours to do. But uh, there you go. As any as any um, fun and challenging task <laughs> turns into, right? So I was uh, I was really uh, excited and happy uh, with the way it came out. So um, let me tell you a little bit about the status of it. Uh, what I did was work to capture a bunch of the last call, 
Um, and I did capture a bunch of the content of the last call. Um, I didn't complete that effort uh, even after six hours. Uh, the main thing I was working on was figuring out the, how I would capture it. Um, so that was ended up being very successful. Um, I'll drop a link to this in the chat. Maybe I'll just do that right now so that you can play along at home a little bit. Oops. Yeah. Um, and I'll put that in the Mattermost chat later. Uh, so one of the one of the things I did was uh, one of the problems I've had doing this before is that, well, it'd be nice if the call fed into this larger knowledge base that, of everything ever, right? So that has always been kind of an intimidating uh, prospect. What I did this time is like, how about if I make a what I called a hypertext knowledge workbook um, uh, of just this call and the topics therein, right? So that's what I did. Um, this one, you're looking at a regular website, uh, and this is not the best way to look at at uh, the thing that I've got, this hypertext workbook. I'm going to switch over to something that's maybe a little bit less familiar, um, but, but a little bit more powerful, and this is Obsidian. So this page here uh, is also this page here uh, in my Obsidian on my computer. Um, if you, uh, if you <coughs> down here, there's a, a link to a zip file. You can, you can download all these files as a zip, um, and they're just plain text files. Um, they're in Markdown, um, but Markdown, let me switch this real quick. Markdown looks a lot like text with a few extra things, uh, like the way you do links and stuff like that. But mostly it's just text, so don't, don't find that intimidating. Um, I really, really would love uh, as many people as can to download the, the zip file um, and just unzip it and, and poke through it. So. Uh, what I did is I ended up deciding that these kind of calls uh, get arranged into, maybe I'll go to the homepage here. The homepage on, on this thing is always called README. Um, and it's the same as this. So these buttons up here help you navigate through to, it's the same as these, these things here. Um, here are all your smiling, wonderful faces. Um, each of these pages is not very well filled in because I didn't get to that. So there are a few pages that say this page needs more text. And sooner or later, um, they'll accumulate more text. Uh, I did fill in mine because I happen to have this um, boilerplate elsewhere and other wikis. So I just grabbed it and copied it over. Um, but the interesting thing is these calls come in books and organizations and people and resources and topics. And when I kind of got that organizational structure that there's not too many things and that you can always find the right place to put something, um, it made things a lot easier for me. So uh, the books, most of the books we talked about last time are these, Computer Lib, Dream Machines, uh, Possiplex, Glass Bead Game, Great Transformation. A lot of these are kind of the same things that we, we've talked about over and over, right? So here's the dawn of everything. Um, this is a pretty good example of something that got filled in a little bit. So this, I think, is is um, uh, this is Gil talking about it real quick. Stunning and deeply important. Uh, one of you compared it to Galileo and Darwin. Um, so it was not too hard for me to find that and uh, say that uh, um, Julio here actually, you know, this is what what he said. Uh, this is another thing that I did with many of the topic and book and people pages. Uh, this is pulled straight out of Wikipedia. And here's a link to the Wikipedia page. So let me show you a couple more of those things. If I go to topics, here is many of the topics that we talked about. Some of these things are kind of standard stuff like great man theory or Indra's net or meme. Um, and so I didn't, you know, we, we mentioned meme. Uh, we didn't really talk about it. This is another thing where it's got content from Wikipedia and that's all. Um, but other things, uh, we actually had a new conversation about. If, um, uh, Grace uh, grabbed a, a, a really cool thing. If you measure the feminine things, you corrupt them. Um, so uh, I grabbed, this is a copy paste from the transcript that Grace, uh, Grace said. Uh, she attributed it to Heather Hines, and Jerry and I haven't found Heather Hines yet, so we'll have to talk about that. But um, in Obsidian, I'm starting to play with uh, these hashtags. Uh, in the wiki, they don't do anything. Uh, in, um, 
uh, in here, they actually light up as, as ta uh, tags. And then uh, over here, I can click on the tag thing. These are all of the, the hashtags that I've included. Uh, this is going to turn into, maybe not in this version of this workbook, but in works book like this in the future, this will turn into kind of what we used to think of as the index in the back of a, a book, right? So, oh, wow, we talked about uh, inter interdisciplinarity. Um, what book is, or what uh, page is that on? It's on the 8 Flux Superpowers page. Um, so this is Jerry talking about the 8 Flux Superpowers. Uh, this is a screen grab from the video uh, when Jerry was talking about it because it's got the nice brain thing here. Uh, this text uh, I pulled off of this uh, screen grab. Um, but uh, this text, which is kind of the same thing with a little bit of uh, discussion by Jerry is this this all is copied out of the transcript and cleaned up a little bit. So to do all of this, and I'll, I'll kind of wrap this up pretty quick here. Um, to do all of this, I started with the Zoom chat. Uh, this is a more nicely formatted version of it, thanks to Bentley Davis's tool. Uh, and I kind of went through this real fast and made a list of the topics and people and books and things like that um, in, in one of these um, table of contents pages. So then uh, another re asset resource I've got is rough transcript. Uh, this is a machine that went through, you know, listened to the whole recording and, and typed it up for us basically. Um, it does, uh, you know, it does a 96% job, um, means that there's a lot of um, problems with it, but there's still, you know, there's still, it, there's still the bones of stuff here and you can skim through it and again, make a list of um, stuff uh, to go back and clean up and then you can start to link things. Uh, once you have that, the backbone of the things uh, in the call, then you can start to fill it in, right? So. Um, here's a link to Amory Levins. This is the Wikipedia thing. Uh, this is also a Wikipedia thing. I haven't done anything with nuclear energy or, or um, uh, Amory. Um, this, you know, someday I could kind of link topic nuclear energy to climate problem and climate problem res responses. Um, this again is a page where I could probably fill these in more a little bit from Wikipedia, but uh, this is something where Gil said, you know, we've got a plan for climate climate uh, change, and uh, this is a place where it would be fun to to um, annotate this up and link it more. So there you go. Um, I'll I'll post links. Please play with it. Please, um, uh, when you download it, it's yours to keep forever. Is the way I think of it. Um, you can make changes and and send them back to me, or you can make you know you can send me an email and say, hey, this is. Uh, something you should add, or please add my bio, or please take me out of that. I don't want to be in that list. Um, but please play with it, um, and I'll keep doing. I'll keep doing this um, this process. I won't necessarily do it for all of the OGM calls, um, but I'm happy to talk more about this process and especially teach other people how to contribute uh, to do this by yourself and all that kind of stuff. Um, Gil has some questions about infrastructure. I just want to add one comment, or maybe two comments. One, um, Pete, wow, awesome. Uh, like, like his post-processing is phenomenal, and like, could you could start to imagine lots of places it might go, lots of ways it might weave into other sorts of things, et cetera, et cetera. And the documents you're creating are basically markdown files on GitHub, so they're they're kind of openly available for for messing around with, which is you know part of the objective here. Um, second thing is, uh, so when you did a whole bunch of work here and when there's a page for Doug or Gil or Stacy in the thing you just created, um, at some point you can, you, you should, we should be able to connect into existing pages for each of us, which are managed by us in some distributed identity. You know, what's our, per, what's our preferred profile? And then you link to that and, and, and awesome. And then somehow there's a chain of quotes that that person did in each of the different conversations that shows up as their trail thread, trail thread, or something like that. I don't know what that might look like, but but you just put in an enormous amount of work solo. And imagine if, as a hive, we start you know working this together, and each of us starts curating the stuff that we care about and the stuff that we're responsible for and the stuff that represents us and blah 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 blah. That gets really cool really fast. Um, and uh, Gil's going to ask you uh, which. If you're looking in the chat, uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, 
yeah. Do you want to go ahead and address that, and then we'll see if oh, but, but before before I ask those yeah. questions, cool. uh, which I've already asked, I just want to say um, thank you and deep bow of gratitude to you. This is pretty awesome, um, and uh, I like how you've organized it. I'm curious how much time it took you because it seems that this is a big lot of work. After each call, it can't fall on one person. Um, but it also can't be just idiosyncratically each of us doing it the way we want. I mean, it could be that, but it would lose some value. Um, so uh, any, any thoughts on how this, how this works going forward and then the questions in the chat? Um, it's, uh, I'll, I'll take that last one first. Um, my, my, wish, um, my wish is that during a call that we would, we would actually do the, enact the process of, of uh, digesting the call and making all the links that would slow the call way down mm -hmm. um, and that would mean that an hour and a half call would cover you know um, a quarter of what we covered before or a fifth or an eighth or something like that I not personally necessarily a bad thing we don't know if that's good or bad I, I yeah I I personally um, I'm all in on that that one um, I think the I, I think the process of processing what we've talked about um, even if it slows us down and we get to talk about fewer things in one call, um, helps us go deeper and richer and get everybody on the same page better, knowing more, knowing, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that I learned pulling this together about Herman Hesse or, yeah. you know, I, you know, a bunch of stuff is like, oh, wow, this is why, you know, Jerry's always talking about this book or whatever, right? Um, so I, I, I would think that I, that's what my wish. Um, <laughs> I was talking with my buddy Wendy Elford about this, and you know, I said, and I, and I suggested that we do it this way, and and she says, Pete, you and I both know that you and I love doing this, and probably nobody else really loves doing this, um, so that's not going to happen. Um, so, uh, uh, another, you know, another, uh, another fantasy or or idea, another wish I had um, doing this. Uh, and I'm not, uh, I'm gonna say something about money, but but not because I care about the money. Um, uh, this, you know, there's six hours of work here. I think it would be a little bit less. We could maybe do it in four if we already had some of this, the material pulled together from other works books that we've done before, but it's still a significant amount of work. And um, and uh, I, I had this like image. Uh, I had this image of my head uh, at the end of the call, kind of like in church, you pass the, the hat along and, and collect up, you know, enough money to pay uh, one or two or four people to digest for four hours uh, and produce an artifact. Um, that's another way to do it. Um, I think that that's a, kind of a misbalance. I, I don't think that's the best way to do it. I think the best way to do it is for everybody to do it together. But so um, real quick, uh, Otter does uh, have a beautiful integration with Zoom that lets you identify the speakers. Um, I, I ended up starting with Descript, uh, which uh, is a beautiful tool for um, editing transcripts at editing videos. Uh, you, it makes the transcript and then literally you edit the transcript like you're editing a text document and the video gets up and ends up getting edited for you. Um, you don't really need to do that. It turns out you don't really need to do that uh, for this kind of call. Um, you don't need to make a perfect transcript. Um, you just uh, and, and interestingly enough, it turned out that um, between the transcript, what I ended up doing was downloading the video. I've got it set up in VLC, a video player, and it's really easy to, to, to switch back and forth to the right place. So I'm looking at the transcript and then it's like, you know, somebody says something and then the name is garbled because the machine didn't understand it. So I just scroll to the right place in the video and, oh, it's, you know, uh, it's Grace talking or it's Wendy talking or whatever. So I ended up not needing the speaker identification much um, in this process. Um, a couple of notes before I pass the, the mic to Wendy. Um, one is that um, we, I forgot that because on the Thursday calls, we're using Collective Next's Zoom room still, which does give us an auto transcript, which does contain the speakers. So. We, we actually had the active file, which you might have been able to import into the script, but I'm not sure, which might have given you a leg up, Pete. So, yeah. so that, that's kind of in the background. But also that, also to note that in order to get Otter integration with uh, Zoom, you've got to be paying for the corporate account, not the pro account, which most of us who are paying uh, Zoom at all are the one, you know, that's what we've got. So the Otter integration doesn't actually come with that. Um, and then there's a bunch of free tools that are emerging as Zaps, which are Zoom applets, 
that, so, that some of which just do free trans, most of which are not being charged for yet, but they will, you can tell, because that's their business plan, uh, but they're trying to attract some attention that do AI note-taking and a bunch of other stuff. And we're, we're thinking of playing with some of that, but we don't want to get trapped in any proprietary tool, which is one of the problems with Descript, which is it's super powerful, but it's a, it's a private business that wants to, wants to make, a, make a living doing that. Um, uh, but also labeling who the speakers are will probably be really useful. And it, it's probably a feature we want to sort of turn on and off uh, in terms of seeing who spoke or what was said. But but that metadata is actually like I, pretty I important. feel like um, I, I feel like. I don't know, there's a weird thing where it wasn't important it, it, in this artifact, it, it ended up not being important. Um, Descript for what it's worth usually does a good job of um voice printing everybody so it, it it knows the voice prints and you can tell it this voice print is jerry or this voice print is wendy and it just says oh all of that voice print is wendy um on this particular recording it completely failed it didn't do that at all so that's oh, why um i you know i i might have ended up with uh, uh speaker tags but uh, for some reason the script failed cool real quick i want to yeah. show uh another thing that i didn't show um uh, which is a pretty uh, graph visualization. Um, and uh, there's a couple things that I did to get this graph visualization. Um, so Pete is back in Obsidian, and this is an Obsidian plugin. Uh, it's actually an, one of the built-in plugins, so it's a, a default thing. There's oh, another cool. fancier graph visualizer, which is a little bit uh, more buggy, but it does more stuff. Yep. Um, so so you can see, because I've, I've started linking things, planning and plans is related to Dwight Eisenhower and Doug and the eight flux superpowers and climate problem responses and Chauncey Bell and Dave Snowden. Um, uh, this map, the way it's set up, uh, I've also got topics in green and people in gold and books in, in red there. Um, so you can say that you can also see that life is uh, uh, new couple Paris, Paris club, Paris club, positive cartography, corporate longitude, um, et cetera. Um, I wonder this one, it's interesting that this one, sometimes when the, the, the map gets a little bit more dense, you start to get connections between things that you can, you know, uh, like second and third order relationships. I don't think it's just a kind of a coincidence that, that this one overlays that one. Um, the, this is a, a pretty good map of the interconnection of kind of the, the topics uh, I dropped out in this um, a couple major stars, um, and I'm going to put them back in there. So you can see that um, the table of contents pages for topics and people and books relates to all the topics. Um, oops. Uh, that map is also live. So if you click on a thing, or you know, people is related to all the people. Uh, this is cute, but it's not very useful. I guess you know there's a, a time and, and place for this, but um, the way I had it before, uh, where you you don't have these major hubs, uh, you can drop those out and see the the underlying structure better. Is there a link to this map? <clears throat> um, that map is interactive in Obsidian, um, and you can if you're running Obsidian, it's you just turn it on basically. So otherwise, no. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm doing more flint and rocks than obsidian. Uh, Kevin, you just muted yourself accidentally, I think. I just said I'm, I'm doing more flint and rocks than obsidian. I don't know. Got it. Um, thanks. And uh, one more thing before I pass the mic to Wendy, because I think Wendy, you still want to probably jump in, um, <clears throat> which is um, some piece of this. I don't know how much of this, Pete, because you've gone so far further than our initial conversations. Um, <clears throat> uh, OGM has a small grant from the Jim Rutt Family Foundation to stand up a podcast, which I'll also check in about. And part of what Pete is working on is, uh, we call it Project Krav, K-R-A-V, which is the automation of, hey, Zoom says you've got a recording ready. 
now what? And there's uh, typically every time we do a call like this, I do a bunch of a, a little bit of manual labor to download the call, clip it a little bit, upload the call to YouTube, post about the call on our Mattermost channel, et cetera, et cetera, uh, add the link to my brain. There's a bunch of sort of manual labor. And Pete is trying to automate as much as of that as possible and then put that in, you know, in the world as open scripts or some open uh, Zapier scripts or uh, some, some other kind of tool that lets you queue. Uh, or sequence a bunch of activities like this so that, um, and I'll put this in the context of the podcast, so that, for example, uh, the Weaving the World podcast will have episodes and then it will have shadow episodes, or we're still trying to figure out nomenclature, um, but the idea that um, we will then do a lot of post-processing about the episodes so that we can go deeper and, and sort of ask questions and slow things down. And so the wouldn't it be great if we slowed things down and collaborated? Doesn't have to happen during each live call. What I'm trying to build in this podcast with sort of separate kinds of episodes is the ability to slow down the clock a little bit and focus and ask questions and curate together um, after each episode. And uh, we're uh, like launching that now. Um, so, and I understand that I'm being automated in the chat, which is actually pretty cool. I mean, uh, April's not worried about my getting Alzheimer's because she figures she'll just talk to my brain in the future. Um, Wendy, uh, uh, we may have stolen all your thunder, but did you want to jump in? Did not at all. That's totally fine. Awesome. My question has already been answered because I wanted to see the graphy thing. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I can, can telepath sometimes. Uh, and Nicely Pete, done. And Pete, if somebody is in, if somebody is, is connected to that GitHub repo through Obsidian and can see the doc, they could easily use the plugin and play with it themselves, correct? Uh, very correct. And I, 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 have to, um, I have to say, you don't even have to use GitHub. If you go to the, that zip link, you click on the zip, it's downloaded as, you know, unzip it, then you've got a directory you can play with. Um, the good thing is for, being interactive, pushing changes back, but you don't have to start there. You can start with a zip file and a text editor, and you you still get a lot of the, the value. The the graph visualizer you'd want to boot up Obsidian, which is I just not that downloaded big. the Obsidian Note Taker app. Is that what I should be downloading, or is it an app? Uh, it is an app. Yeah, um, yep. Obsidian.md, um, and it's, and so what do I do when I now that I what how do I find what you did? Uh, you um, download the zip file. Um, that's in that link somewhere. I just did it on my iPad. Is that going to work? I mean, I got an app. No. And okay. well, uh, you know, it would kind of work. Um, I've never used the uh, the Obsidian mobile apps, um, but if you if you download it on a desktop and then do the synchronization, um, the the Obsidian synchronization, then you'll be able to see it on your iPad. Actually, um, I haven't played with the iPad version at all. I don't know okay. what it's like. Um, I, know, I know a lot of people are still on laptops. That's fine. Um, I should totally try that. That's a good idea. I'm 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 using it on on uh, laptop, iPad, and iPhone. Sync works very well. Uh, the flexibility is a little bit less on the iOS devices. Uh, probably get used to a bowl. I just find that the bigger screen and the keys helps me play on the uh, on the laptop uh, more. Uh, I've I've been working with Obsidian for a few months. At Pete's suggestion, like it a lot. Uh, my question is, Pete, if we if 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 I uh, you're suggesting that we download the zip file for each of these calls and we have it ourselves, and if we monkey with it, nobody else sees those changes. So how do we have a shared editing experience around these? Things? Um, you you step up to the next level where we're synchronized through Git. Okay, will you at some point show us how to do that? Or yeah, be feature? happy to. Yeah. yeah cool. Um, awesome. Any other thoughts, questions about Pete? What Pete just demoed and uh, good. Uh, I mean, uh, this is really fun because it feels like um, it feels like we've been stirring the uh, OGM pot for a long time, kind of making stone soup. And I'm beginning to see like there's a there's a Rotelli noodle over there, and I see some beans and a little bit of sausage and whatever. And like there's a head of a shrimp. And it smells um, good. Pardon? And it smells good. And it smells good. Exactly. Exactly. So this this is fun because uh, we're starting to get somewhere with with um, tools, process, and a bunch of other things, and see where it goes. Um, and Pete, thank you for for connecting those. I've also logged uh, the first URL in my brain connected to this call, connected to you cropping 
last week's call connected to last week's call connected to my map of last week's call, which is a link we could put back into your map. Uh, and, you know, and lather, rinse, repeat with anybody else who wants to take a swing at mapping, recording, uh, riffing on all these kinds of things. I'm, I'm reminded here that uh, maybe a year ago, uh, Max Harper, who is a Miro programming whiz, uh, took one of our transcripts and mapped it in Miro as a dialogue, basically a long, a long uh, rectangle that showed uh, people as smaller rectangles inside and then showed lines like what, what path the discourse took during that one call. Really interesting visualization, one of you know, dozens of things one might do uh, in these ways. So with that, I'll pause on this and then go to our regular check-in routine, which is uh, we're not, we're on the Thursday calls, we used to check in every call and now we're alternating. So next week, we're going on the Mattermost chat for this call, we're going to decide on a topic on a focusing question for next week. And next week we'll spend our, our call on one, uh, one question. Um, mm -hmm. I could probably find that Miro, Wendy, I'll find the link and put it in the chat unless Pete be beats me to it. Um, and, um, and so this week we'll go back to our, our normal routine, which is I just wander through the gallery view uh, in Zoom and ask people to step in and say, what sort of things have you been uh, working on that are kind of uh, OGME? Uh, and uh, Iris, thank you for joining us. Uh, Iris and I met recently, uh, You're welcome. had kind of a getting to know you conversation and I won't call on you first so that you can see what the pattern is uh, as, we, as we sort of check in. It's, not a, it, it's, it's certainly not formal, it's it really simple. Uh, but why don't we go, um, Wendy, Mark, Carranza, Julian. Hi, everyone. Um, let's see, in the last couple of weeks, I have been focusing on updating my website to be able to point people to it so that um, it easily communicates the initiatives that I'm working on, which is primarily front end uh, user interface design to go on top of things like what Pete just created, which is why I was so interested in the visual component. So we're trying to figure out how to do that across other platforms as well. Um, and the primary um, project okay, that I'm working on is, water. Uh, Kevin, is I'm with Vincent's uh, Trove and Jonathan Sand seriously. And we're trying to bring off the two together to create a user interface that's on top of Trove that is a map view of all the data there. So that's the project we've been working on. Um, basically it requires massaging the data in a way that when it gets exported and then imported into Kumu, it, it displays the way we want it to. So it's a little bit of noodling at the moment. Thanks. Awesome, thanks Wendy. Um, Mr. Carranza, then Julian, then Eric. Yeah, I can pass today. Uh, there's lots of people here. Sounds great. Um, Julian, Eric, Kevin Jones. Uh, so a quick comment is right. I have three conferences coming up in the next two weeks. And uh, right now I'm preparing presentations for those. The main one being the OGM topic related topic would be history and actual technicalities of storing 3D models in databases and making them accessible. So. Uh, do you want to say a little bit more about the 3D models or I think, uh, you know, there's uh, a couple. Oh, okay. Because the idea is uh, you're used to history as text and pictures and art and photos of things. And in my world universe view, you should be storing 3D. And in fact, this is what I did for Lego 25 years ago was to store 3D models of Lego bricks and sets. And um, more than just the 3D models, because those are static and we live in a world that's based on time. And so in my view, we need to be storing experiences. So if you've ever played with VR, your, whatever you did is different from whatever anybody else did. In fact, it's different from the next time you do it. So in my view, when we talk about history, all of this stuff needs to be going in there, not just photos of things. So the uh, discussion at the Web3D, well, the presentation at the Web3D conference is, well, okay, it sounds great. How do you do that? And then that's, that's the discussion is, how do you do that? Cool, thank you. You make me think that there ought to be a, a, leg, a Zoom Lego plugin that makes us all look like mini fakes, just there auto is, automagically. There is. Uh, I saw one a couple of years ago. So that'll, it'll, that'll make it. It'll make a mini fig out of you. Yeah, and well, can, that'd be cool. Yeah, especially if you make it a requirement that everybody have a mini fig avatar instead of just the, the webcam. We could totally have like the Lego call. 
Okay. Let's see if we can find that. Um, let's go, Eric, Kevin, Allison. Yeah. Well, for my synagogue, we use filters on Zoom for Purim. So people put things on their nose and hair. So that's cool. Um, so what I want to show is a yeah, prototype that I worked all weekend on. <laughs> um, but what I was doing was looking at one of Ted Nelson's designs. He calls it zigzag. And um, let's just think long term, if we could have a decentralized web with this type of data structure and multiple applications feeding into it. So it's going to look old school, but think in the future. OK, so now let me share desktop. OK, um, can people see my screen? Yes. OK, mm. so what we're looking at is um, Ted Nelson's demo of ZigZag, and he uses the royal families of Europe. So as you're scrolling through this list, um, you can see um, it in different ways. Now, there are dimensions at the top. Um, one, two, and three are the default dimensions. And I'm just going to show you what he demonstrates. So say um, you um, switch views and what I want to show you is, uh, let's go to another, OK, not the view. I want to show you a different dimension on the x-axis. So as I press x, um, it's going to bring up um, different uh, dimensions. And I can't, I have to move that. OK, so I'm getting to the ones that he, I added some for my prototype. So here is Queen Victoria, her birth date and death date, because I changed the x-axis to date. And now let's change the y-axis to a different dimension. So think of it as filtering the data so that um, only what's shown in the dimension is what's shown in here on the y-axis. And you have a z-axis as well. So. What he's showing here is that um, it has, um, if I change the x-axis again, OK, I want x-axis to be marriage and y-axis to be children. But here, here, I just have the opposite. So here are Victoria's children. And then you can go down and see um, yeah, Mary of Tech. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm trying to find Elizabeth, <laughs> yeah, Elizabeth Bowes, Elizabeth II. And here's uh, Charles. So. Now, that's where the tree ends right now, but let's add Diana. So I'm going to say new and go down here. And he had two wives. So we're breaking this model all of a sudden. So we have to add Diana. So uh, the editing is a little kludgy in this wouldn't, version. Wouldn't Henry VIII have forced this model to like at least extend Yeah, probably. A right. But to be with Diana and Camila, we have enough test data. <laughs> OK, so Diana had children and Camila had children from another person. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so let's just do Diana's kids. So I'm going to uh, click back in here. And we're going to do a new in the map. Well, OK, in the children dimension. That's what I have on X. OK, so now I do uh, yeah, click here, new to the right. OK, so there are two children of Diana. Then we could add Harry and uh, William and their wives and their kids. So you get the idea. Mm -hmm. So I created a jerry rig application. So <laughs> well, my instructions are here. Change x to the dimension OGM calls. So I'm just scrolling. OK, went past it. So let's get back to OGM calls. And then the y axis will be attendees. OK, so you see how it's tweening as you go. So here is a date, October 21st. And I just did some test data. Three people on that Can call. Link to what? Uh, oh, are you link to link Sorry. Uh, I have Kevin. left. Kevin is accidentally unmuting himself. So I okay. just remuted him. OK, thanks. And I thank Hank for making me host uh, before he had to go. Right. Go ahead. So thinking dimensionally, so here is looking at your data in terms of calls and attendees. So that, that's like a high level view. So like I made up a sample call with just the women and then another call uh, of everybody, just as a sample. But on this one, I expanded it further. So now I'm telling you put the transcript dimension on Y. OK. And um, then over here, um, I gave you more instructions. Put the chat on X and the thread on Z. Hmm. OK, so we'll put uh, chat and then thread on the Z dimension. Here it is. OK, 
So now it looks like a spreadsheet, but it's not really a spreadsheet. It's just, it's a really connections among multidimensional data. Okay. So here's an example of a transcript where the computer thought I was saying kombucha, but I was really drinking kombucha. So I edited it later and changed it here. And then these cells could be linked in other ways as well. But um, there were rules about what you could link across the, well, you know, see a cell, think of it as an immutable object and it has like a right and a left. And then you could connect those to any other dimension it, and uh, so like you could have a right in multiple dimensions. So what I did was try to figure out how you would show a thread. So, hi, Stacy, how are you? And Stacy says, good, how are you? Well, what is she referring to? So I'm gonna go in the Z dimension and it was referring to time two when I said, how are you? And then Jerry came in and this fine thank you, who am I thanking? Oh, I'm thanking Stacy. So I just navigated in the Z dimension and back. So that could be a three-dimensional view, OpenGL, whatever you want. But the data sure. structure is what I'm talking about. Yeah. I want to ask a question. If you sure. go back to Victoria, yeah. can you also look at property? <clears throat> you know, I am the Duke of X, the Earl of Y. Can you add a, a, a you property can. land power dimension to the people? You could add whatever dimensions you want. I mean, the, the structure is however you design it. For example, looking down here, um, yeah, I, I just uh, clarified a transcript. So like I said something and then I clarified it with this text. And then uh, like Jerry asking a question, I'm responding with a video and like there's no column that says, here, it should be a, like a video link. It's just, I'm deciding the structure as I go. So that could get messy if you don't do, do it right, but it, it takes a while to think in this way, but look at this value here. So like I said, I met Tet Nelson and Jerry put a comment in the chat that says Xanadu is the best thing since sliced bread. And this is the timestamp. So this could be a link to the YouTube video at that time to see what people were talking about while Jerry was typing. And then here is the Xanadu link. That could be a link out to the web. And then here is Stacy with a disagreement where she says, I had difficulty using it. So these types of rich links where we define what type of link it is, like you, you want to track different things like references to sources. So um, this could be another dimension, like a link type, but it's up to us. So like this is just after trying various things, I, I came up with this simple idea that I didn't want to complicate it too much with uh, with linking, uh, like I felt the chat could be part of the transcript here. And then it's browsable like this, okay? And then, um, yeah, so. And Eric, are, yes. you, are you using vanilla zigzag software? Did you create, did you sort of uh, add to this? Yeah, problem? this is Ted's demo that uh, he has on his uh, zigzag page. This was created in Finland and it's called GZZ. So anyone could download and run his demo and I just extended it with uh, a, a, a prototype for what we're looking for. And can this run on like, like the data that Pete is building and dropping into a GitHub repo as markdown files? Could this yeah. just be an alternate view on the same sets of data that has its own kind of metadata? Well. This software is old and not maintained anymore. Um, you can ex import an XML file. I haven't figured out how to do that, but it's possible if you want to play around with these ideas. But the important thing is how do you think about your data in multiple dimensions? Like which dimensions would make sense for you? And then what kind of visualization would work for you where you could rotate in and see like maybe as you're looking at a cell, you might want to see what dimensions are available and then pick one in an easier way. And then he has different views of how you can navigate. But what I just want to show next is um, a spreadsheet of my idea for putting it on the decentralized web. Cool. So here it is. It's coming up. Yep. Thanks. Yep. So this will be it. I just want to show what I was thinking.
OK, so I'm looking at a structure called hypercore. Let me just make it bigger. So the test data that we were looking at is here on the right. So I just mapped the transcript and sample chats and responses. And then I figured out how I want, what dimensions I would want to store. And the first thing is a list of dimensions. So a hypercore is just an append only log where you just keep adding data. So like if you have a dimension time, it would be, it would have an address on the web, which is like a 64 digit hex number. And, uh, but with that number, anybody who is looking for that hash will be able to find it across a decentralized network using the hypercore protocol. So if I had all these dimensions, I'm able to link them up and create like an example of a rich link. Um, Eric with these comments and it's a chat and it's a URL link or other types of links, um, you know, the link types of comments, disagreements. Okay, so this is just the technical way of, one way of implementing it. And then I had a, uh, started figuring out, okay, well, how would I load all this data into memory? How would I select the latest version? And how would I show the transcript? So this is the technical side for people who wanna think about implementing it with newer technologies, but this is just a starting point. Um, so it's essentially like building a database all over again, um, but on the web in a de distributed way. And um, see these hypercores are replicated across peers. So like if Pete has one of these and I have another one and we're uh, seeding each other, like like Pete is seeding, seeding uh, maybe the events and I'm seeding utterance, then we can communicate. It, it'll replicate whatever new events are added on Pete's side to my version of the events. So there is now what's called multi-rider and it's using a rebasing technology which will so, synchronize yep so i think you're you're you, you have already um, redlined the geekometer on this call um, sure. and, and and but i but i love what you're showing us it's very ogme uh but you're also now treading into territory where i know. I, I like i think i know what you just said but i'm actually not very sure well, I just wanted to get it on the record so we can then go back and uh, ask questions and expand on it in the future. Exactly. Perfect. Um, and um, it's really interesting because the thing, the experiment in Miro that I mentioned that Max did a, a long time ago was a really, really, really simple, simple, simple version of something that you just showed us in, you know, Ted Nelson's tool to zigzag through the universe, mm -hmm. um, which turns into a bunch of other, in, you know, very interesting ways of, of seeing and connecting. And then later, uh, navigating through the, uh, the the things that are happening in the world. So so thank yeah. you for that. Let me yeah, pause and see who has questions or comments um, on what you just showed us. Yeah, just remember, it's long term thinking with this. Mm -hmm. um, Pete, go ahead. I, I it's really cool. Um, awesome work, Eric. Um, I, I like where it's going, and I like I like the idea of hooking you know hooking it up to more stuff. So congratulations, good job. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I, you made me think a bunch about what I like about using the brain, which is that it has a dimensionality that's like way less flexible than what you just showed. Like you can just kind of pick your, pick your dimensions and sort of cruise through them. Um, but the brain is kind of like this chalkboard that only does one kind of connection, except it's really expressive for me. So, so I like, you know, royalty, the peerage, kings and queens, dukes and all that. Um, I don't have all of them. And in fact, crawling through uh, UK history, it's really, really actually complicated and twisty. I don't know how anybody ever memorizes that. Uh, but I do have like all the popes because one day I just decided, let's put all the popes in. And on the Wikipedia, very conveniently, at every pope, it says previous pope, next pope. And there's Wikipedia pages for all of them. So I kind of chased through that. And then I did a really light connecting of the popes into their era, like the, you know, the, the edict of Nantes is over here mm -hmm. and it, it happened in the city of Nantes. And so you could do, you could crawl through the same set of data um, with this particular view and it would, it would make another group of people happy, right? Because right. one, of, one of my beliefs about visualization is that <clears throat> um, a lot of us, we, I don't, and I don't know what the clusters are, 
But the brain for a small subset of the population, the brain display is like really compelling and really works. And for a bunch of other people, it's like, what was that tangle of stuff? but a different visualization might work for them. And if we can right. separate the data from the visualizations and create a menu of options, we might actually get more people using these kinds of tools and connecting things up. Yeah, so what I'm hoping to do is experiment with the data structures only and see what if I could get a, a recreation of that system with a new name on the decentralized web. And then, um, then we could experiment with visualizations and people can write their own apps against it. Um, but in terms of sense making, think of the value if each person took a portion of the data and made their own sense, connecting their own links, and then they make it available for people to look at and comment on and link up. And then you, yeah, it, it, it's endless what you could, you could do. Bingo. Yeah. And with a little bit of um, uh, AI mm -hmm. or machine learning connected to events and connected to what we're doing, much of the linking you just talked about and some of the correcting like come bookshop yeah um could be done out automatically and and right. so a lot, a lot of this improving and curating winds up starting to get automated nicely because one of the problems with like life logging everything is that <laughs> every little utterance winds up starting to seem important in the larger thing and you lose the wheat for the chaff right. like it gets it gets really hard you have to ha have some editorial judgment about what gets included and what doesn't uh, or at least what gets promoted to the foreground and what doesn't, because it, yeah. you know, the internet is full of chaff and we still make our way through it. Yeah, well, um, you have a combination of automation and curation that works for you. Yep, exactly. So thank you. That was a, that was a sure. cool, cool demo. Uh, let's go, Kevin, Doug, Michael. I just want to, um, I've been doing some interesting things. And I want to follow up on Eric. What I'd love to see is have that applied to the British royal family back in a time of change, like York versus Plantagenet. And then look at uh, the growth in fortified capital, castles with at least a thousand acres and those with 5,000 acres and see the Yorks and the Plantagenists go back and forth and get really deep around relationships there. And then you have to look at who, who are the heirs that are on both sides and which, which way the power shifted while well, you see the geography shift over 50 or 60 years. And then there's lots of people who, I'm in two different Tudor related uh, Facebook groups because I really am into the Shakespearean histories. And so a lot of people would add lots of stories onto that kind of thing. So it's a place where there's already a lot of uh, uh, people focusing and, and who want to know more and, uh, you know, with tourist things, et cetera. But, uh, you know, I don't think anybody's shown that, that, that I've not seen anything in those things that shows that the power shift between Plantagenets and Yorks over time uh, and, and uh, the, the value of each of their resources. So that would just be, I think, kind of a fun thing to I would, want to play there. I would love to see that. And there's also a, a, a kind of a young discipline called digital humanities. It's really not that old. Uh, people doing everything from, you know, searching through literary texts uh, and doing history and connecting it up and applying all of this cool geeky stuff to the humanities. And it's brilliant. It's like really, really cool. Um, a, a quick update on what I'm doing. <clears throat> um, please. Come up with this idea of a repair fund. Uh, we have uh, a major tourist industry here in Asheville, North Carolina. It's founded on the Biltmore Mansion, which is the largest house in the country. And it's, a, it's on an industrial scale that people have to come see, even though they feel bad about it because they displace the Shiloh community and the Shiloh gets nothing. So we created a repair fund uh, that will be controlled by the Shiloh community and the tourism development authorities really like it. The Biltmore really likes it. And we've got two other cities who we're trying to do it in uh, Chicago and in Indianapolis uh, around similar things where displacement and tourism and you're you're relieving liberal guilt and they're and they're letting uh, the powerless have power so they, they feel good about it and then they want to buy things like fleece vests that show that they did the repair fund and that you know the self identifying virtue signaling with product sales and the money is controlled by the community and it seems to be uh, catching on pretty quickly. There's technical things I could talk about it. In, in one of the places we're helping people uh, in, in Cincinnati and in uh, Asheville, uh, there's predatory housing folks who are trying to, to disrupt the already displaced communities. And so we're setting up a land bank and figuring out how to do that. And in Chicago it, and Baltimore, it's uh, neighborhood land trusts, neighborhood investment trusts that are trying to preserve Black Wall Streets from uh, predatory uh, 
hedge funds and stuff. So it's a similar kind of uh, property values uh, with the control going to the people. So it's, it's catching on really quickly. And it uh, turns out the authorities really like to signal that they're doing this stuff and they want to get out of the politics of letting government decide what reparations is and bossy scholars who say it's only this and stuff. You just take this action. So anyway, it's kind of cool. Thanks, Kevin. Um, anyone with thoughts, comments on that? Please, Eric. Yeah, um, when you were talking about doing more research on the British royal families and specific things, um, see, I, I'm realizing there's a connection to data warehousing that uh, the you could because in companies they build dimensional models. And uh, if you took all the, this data and put it into a, a database and ran a cube against it, you could do that kind of deep analysis. So it's similar to something that's already out there, but what I want to do is extend it in a way that it's available to everyone on the web. Cool. Sounds awesome. Also, uh, also, I have a particular interest in like revolutions in military affairs, Kevin. And so the construction of castles changes significantly as cannons get better, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that, that shifts power between these families, uh, you know, uh, on, on the battlefield often. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Charlemagne innovated with stirrups and his knights were able to push folks off their horses. Uh, and so um, uh, I'll, I'll share it in the link, but I have, a, I have a link of, actually, let me just do it real quick. Um, uh, a little quick screen share. And... Um, Um, so I have a thought that's basically of uh, different, uh, different works that influence lots of people. I think I've shared it on a call or two before here, but for me, it was, uh, James Burke's connection series. Come on, little brain. Mm -hmm. There we go. So for me, it was James Burke's connection series, which is very much like this conversation. And he would, he, he would, you know, he would say, Hey, uh, then there's the stirrup. And all of a sudden, when you show up on the battlefield with the stirrup, you win some battles, you win some territory and it changes history. Uh, but then there's other influential books like uh, Atlas Shrugged, oh my gosh, As We May Think by Van Iver Bush, uh, Star Trek and Star Wars, uh, mm. et cetera, et cetera. And Clue Train I have in, on here as well. But for instance, Ray and Charles Eames, The Powers of Ten video uh, influenced a lot of people. And, and each of these, uh, Indiana Jones, I have on this list. And I'm happy to add things to the list. If anybody uh, sees that I'm missing them, I'll put the, I'll put the link in. But I think for the creation of works is really important because some of the works really stick and change a lot of people's uh, path and opinions. Uh, and with that, let's go back to our check-in. Uh, we've got uh, Doug Michael Iris. Okay, uh, the thing that's been on my mind a lot is what's happening with COP26. And what's striking to me is that the default is that the only way to get social change is by investing. And the problem with investing is, of course, it wants a profit. And the people who are looking for profit want guarantees on the project. So even if the projects fail, they get paid off. And meanwhile, wealth is still concentrating. It's amazing history as to how it is that COP ends up being purely financialized. There's no other dialogue really going on there. Uh, anyway, that's my first thought. Second thought is I've been reading Arnold Toynbee uh, and David Graeber and Pitram Sorokin, who wrote a wonderful book on cultural dynamics. And the three of them together give a very complex and compelling sense of why civilizations get into trouble and by implication why we're in trouble. Anyway, that's it. Um, thank you. I, I'm good. So Iris has to leave shortly. Can I just flip you into the queue right this second? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my, my, my apologies. I didn't realize you had to, had to book it, but um, please, if you don't mind. Yeah, no worries. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I, I received an invitation from Jerry a little while ago, and um, it's nice to be here. I'm, I have to get shot and learn what's, what's going on, but it's great. I'm looking forward to take part um, in the next discussions. And my background is uh, in information science, just for the record. Uh, and I've been doing, um, I mean, Jerry got in touch with me because he read a, a blog I wrote about uh, tacit knowledge. I've been doing my PhD about tacit knowledge and Anaka's work at Edinburgh Napier University. 
so very fond of knowledge, information science, and, and all that. And greetings from Europe, actually, because I live in Ljubljana, Slovenia. <laughs> so that's all for me for now. Oh, thanks, Iris. And I just posted a link to the, 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 that particular post that had attracted my mm -hmm. attention, which was about the concept of Ba, yeah. uh, which comes out of Nanaka. And Ba, ba is sort of the space of knowing. And context, yeah, space of knowledge. Context, yeah. context for knowledge, space of knowing, things like that. Uh, it's a lovely, lovely concept. And I like to think that OGM is one of those sorts of things. Uh, ba is just BA, Julian. BA, yeah. Yeah, um, I'll Japanese, put- Japanese concept. So actually, let me just do a quick screen share. So here's the here's the, the post there, and uh, Iris writes about there are four types of ba: cyber ba, exercising ba, interacting ba, and originating ba. You can read the post for background, and then here's uh, ba itself, which is a Nonaka concept. There, come on, little machine. There we go. Uh, so here's the here's Ikujiro Nonaka and a bunch of other things around it. So shared space for relationships, knowledge management, Japanese culture, et cetera. And the Kinevan framework, which some of us are familiar with that Dave Snowden created, was a competitive response to the idea of Ba. When, when, when Snowden read about Ba, he's like, oh my God, we're working on a bunch of stuff. We need a cool name. So he looked into Welsh and found uh, Kinevan, which means the place of all our belongings. So, so next time you see Kinevin spelled this way, C-Y-N-E-F-I-N, -E um, realize that it's also kind of a competitive reply. Um, William, uh, sorry I have to leave, but I'll, I'll be there longer next time. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate your, your, your being here. Thanks, Jerry. Bye, everyone. Awesome. Bye. Um, so now we have, uh, who do we have left that we haven't gone through? Uh, Michael and... Doug just went, and I think that's it. Stacy passed. Uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Cool. <clears throat> um, I am uh, not not in a great spot right now, so I'm not on video. But um, I will check in. Uh, got here late, but have really been interested in what I I heard. And and Eric, your um, presentation kind of. Uh, set a lot of gears turning. So that's really cool. It really, look, really looks interesting. Um, I just wanted to endorse the event that, that Mark and Pete, I think both posted um, that's uh, late today. Um, and also um, wanted to mention, I, I see that Wendy had uh, said something about um, solid and there's a nice uh, primer, you know, just easy and on solid, just to talk with um, uh, Ethan Zuckerman on his podcast, Remaking the Internet. Um, that's from a little ways back. And that podcast in general, I find is a great doorway into the work of a lot of different people. Um, so just want to plug it for anybody who wasn't already familiar with it. Um, it's uh, remaking the internet, re reinventing the internet, excuse me, um, with Ethan Zuckerman. And it's on Apple Podcasts, but not on some of the other, uh, like it's not on Spotify. And I think I saw somewhere else that it wasn't. Um, and then it has its own site. I'm sorry if I can get to my computer, I'll, I'll post a link, but just wanted to add that. Um, yeah. And I don't, I don't have much of a check-in today. Oh, that's so. fine. No, no worries. <laughs> Thank you. And if, is it today? Sorry, um, Mika Sifri and Kalia Hamlin are also running an open space around Facebook and the Facebook papers and stuff like that. I think uh, the, the sort of the leave Facebook movement or getting off Facebook for several days, the, like a boycott of Facebook, something like that, which is really interesting. And I just had a, I had a conflict and I couldn't, uh, couldn't join. But I think that's today. Um, I don't remember exactly. There's the um, unplugged Facebook movement, which is coming up in a few days. Might be that. Not unplugged, but log out of Facebook from that's November it. 12. So exactly, log out of Facebook. Uh, that will help me find it because that's what I. That is what I put it under. Uh, they have a website, log out of Facebook, or something like that. Oh, 
it's the 12th actually is the event i think oh good um and uh yes uh, here it is uh the facebook uh, log out i guess it's called here's a logging off facebook what comes next uh, here's a link to the event yes yes exactly yeah 9 9 a.m pacific noon eastern um yeah cool um I'm interested in metaverse, Facebook papers, those kinds of issues for a second, if we want to, so we've sort of checked in. And um, uh, Julian, uh, I would love uh, if you, metaverse, yeah, I would love just to hear what your thoughts are on, on Facebook's announcements and renaming and all that, because uh, it seems to be in the air in, in, in the sort of geek community. It's like, hey, wait a minute, what'd they just go do? And you've got a cat in the metaverse. You're muted, so we don't hear you right now. That's actually the cataverse. Okay. Yeah, the kitty was being a little rambunctious. Oh, actually, still is. Uh, my basic observation on whatever you want to call it is that I don't believe a company that's been doing evil for the last decade is going to change its stripes along with a, a name change. So in, in fact, uh, in the work I do with XR, I don't support Facebook products because I don't think many people know that when they, when you put on a Facebook VR device, it's tracking your eye movements and monetizing that, and you have to agree to it. They've said that in Meta, they won't require that, but the question is, okay, well, then what are they going to require? I think it's better to just avoid the situation entirely. And also wanted to point out that many people think metaverse uh, is something that Facebook invented. And this has been around since even Neil Stevenson says that Werner Vinge really brought the concept up in uh, True Names, which was close to uh, 40 years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's not anything new. It's just a massive marketing campaign done in such a way as to get lots 19, of- 1981. Right. Okay. Oh, that is 40 years. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Um, so I view Meta as a new marketing campaign from Facebook done in such a way as to generate lots of free publicity. Otherwise, uh, not much else. So. Um, Pete, uh, do you want to talk about what you want to do with that? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of articles about, uh, well, so um, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg decides that they're going to do the metaverse um, a couple of years ago, but then they, they decide that they're going to get real about it for whatever reason, which is probably not, I don't think it's the real reason that they say. Um, uh, but then a bunch of people start writing about it. So there's a lot of, a lot of information about the metaverse. So almost in an emergent event sense-making way, um, uh, I, I kind of want to set up a website that's just got, uh, you know, here's you know, here's 10, 20, 50, 100 articles about, you know, the origins of the metaverse, uh, true names, um, snow crash, um, you know, all the way up to, you know, what um, Oculus and, you know, Facebook and monetizing your, your eye tracking and all that kind of stuff. So it just seems like there, there ought to be a resource where all that gets collected together. And I guess I haven't gone to look for one, maybe there's one already, but um, in my um, hubris, it's like, let's make a, a website, um, which is uh, underneath it, of course, a massive wiki. I don't know if there's a wiki of it. Um, Ethan Zuckerman's uh, article about, hey, I made a, hey, Facebook, I made a metaverse yeah. bag back when, does a really nice job of stepping through a whole bunch of them, including a few very obscure ones. Uh, and the one, uh, so. Uh, so, you know, so yeah. for years hence, uh, those of us who have been thinking metaverse thoughts for 40 years um, are going to say, and by the way, you should read the Ethan Zuckerman article, right? So, so here's a start of uh, here's a start of of it. Exactly. Right. So here's his here's his piece, and he tells the story of how at while he was at Tripod, um, they basically skinned Lambda Moo, which was uh, Moo's are uh, multi-user object-oriented environments. There was an era, believe it or not, back in the day when Muds and Moo's were really exciting, and we were all like, "Ooh, this is really cool." I, I, and I can relate. So um, uh, 1992 or so, um, in the operations center of Netcom, the biggest internet service provider at the time, um, 
literally uh, all the um, all the customer service reps, technical service reps, um, the people that you would call on the phone, they were all logged into a MUD. Um, and that's how they, they shared information. And that's uh, when, when you left for the day, uh, you kind of needed to leave some state. Hey, the pop in, in Cincinnati is down. If anybody calls, we're fixing it, blah, blah, blah. All of that state was in the MUD. And literally, you'd log into the MUD and kind of read up on what was going on. And, um, and that's it's the, the, you know, the collaboration mechanism that they used. It helped that um, it helped that all those kids, it, they were all kids uh, hired from the Midwest, um, brought to Silicon Valley with promises of big salaries uh, for the Midwest and not big salaries in Silicon Valley. So yeah, <laughs> they could afford to pay rent and, and work at Netcom and that's all. <laughs> but it was a great uh, learning experience for them. Love that. Um, yeah, Microsoft Teams. Um, I had a Teams call yesterday and I was reminded what a crap piece of software Teams is. It's like, really, like, like make Zoom really look great. Like when you come back to Zoom, you're like, phew, I can move windows around. I can, I don't have a little menu that's lying on top of the presentation I'm trying to watch uh, that I can't move or get rid of, et cetera, et cetera. Mr. Kronza. Um, It really depends if you're on a Mac or a PC. If you're on a PC um, and, uh, you're hooked in through um, SharePoint. Through the, through, through the limbic system? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's so basically, you know, in a previous um, life career, I did uh, SharePoint knowledge base systems. Oh, wow. And, and basically, um, it's built on top of SharePoint. And it's amazingly powerful when you get deep into it. I've seen um, online courses that were just absolutely amazing and beautiful. And um, for collaboration um, and uh, uh, participative learning, I, it's, it, I, I haven't seen anything better. It's absolutely fantastic. Then again, I don't. I I I'm a Mac hater. Um, unfortunately, I work on a Mac every day at the <laughs> uh, archive. Well, that sounds hard. But uh, um, yeah, but I'm on a PC right now, so um, I'll go back to my shaving. <laughs> Um, there we go. Yeah, you got the video instead of the audio. Um, cool. And and you show no visible ticks or anything like that from having worked on SharePoint. And and I, I just I think I just tweeted a couple of days ago because somebody had written something about Microsoft, and I I sort of replied by saying, "Gosh, uh, whenever somebody mentions they have to use SharePoint or Teams, I I offer my sympathies, and they always shrug and, and laugh and and agree." Um, so you you have seen a much better side of all of that than I have seen. Um, that's for sure. Um, what you're used to, you know, it's, um, you know, my favorite o OS is DOS. You know, so, um, what, 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 you know, what you can get done in it is uh, amazing if, uh, um, and, and basically, you know, like anything, if you, uh, invest in the uh, learning curve. Um, Mark, let me just point out, you can get lots done with punch cards too. Um, you can get lots done with uh, uh, Tinker Toys as- uh, um, Or Lego bricks even. Yeah, you know, or Lego bricks, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, when I joined Esther in whatever the hell year that was, 90, two, I guess. Um, her word processor was Xyrite. And Xyrite was the PC version of ATEX, which was the newsroom uh, reporters used ATEX to, to submit their stories as slugs. And then ATEX had a little workflow process that it would submit it to editors and blah, 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 And then it would show up in the, in the typesetting uh, device uh, in the newsroom. So uh, Xyrite was like a PC knockoff of it. And it ran in, in DOS, basically. So I had to learn to use Xyrite. And, and Esther's calendar was in Xyrite as a shared file on our little drive. And, and so she had everything she was doing, including who was picking her up at the airport uh, for each trip, what, you know, the phone number for her hotel, what time the pool opened, because Esther has to swim every morning. So all of that was encoded very, very compactly 
in the xyrite. And then once you've absorbed into your, the back of your, the base of your skull, like all the xyrite keyboard commands, it's like WordStar back in the day, or what, what name, you know, if you, if you learned word processing before the simple WYSIWYG ones, um, you kind of embedded a bunch of commands really deep in your system and you like them. You're kind of like, oh, okay, I just do poop, 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 poop. And it's a little bit like you're Bruce Lee fighting off ninjas. Um, and and th those things are hard to shake and hard to get rid of. So, I, you know, e Esther's finally, I think she's finally offside, right? I hope she's finally offside, right? But um, but those things are buried really quite deep. <clears throat> um, I just want to add that uh, um, if you were unlucky enough to work at a newspaper, as I, I, I was uh, working at the Village Voice in the days of ATEX, um, you actually learned to design on ATEX which was not fun. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it prepared you for HTML, but um, yeah, that's all. Yeah, and I used to manually do, I mean, as I write, did a little bit of primitive hyphenation. I mean, it could understand hyphens instead of words, but I used to have to go do widows, orphans, hyphens, all that kind of stuff manually through the issue every time. And then, of course, if we changed something early in the issue, it would cast, you know, it, it would ripple through and I'd have to redo it. and. Boy, it reminds me also the first time I ever saw PageMaker. Uh, I was working in St. Louis uh, for a strategic management consulting group within Price Waterhouse, and before hours at a computer store, Computerland maybe I don't know. Uh, there was a guy from uh, all this, I guess, who showed us PageMaker, and my first question to him when he was done with the demo was, "Oh, cool, that's great." And when you split a column from page one to page five. Does it automatically at the uh, at the top of the column on page five? Does it say continued from page one and then continued? And he looks at me like, "What planet did you just drop off? Like we just launched this. It doesn't do that yet." It's very funny. So we'll take what we can get. Um, any, uh, we are now having a geek off in the. Uh, I was a I was a Pine user for what it's worth back in the day, and Pine is a text editor that means Pine is not Elm. Elm is uh, another word editor, et cetera. Yeah. Oh, man. So um, anybody want to go into one of the topics we put on the table or COP26 that's going on right now, or should we wrap the call? Uh, what about um, the next call topic? That we could do. You mean we could do that with words in, in like real time like this? That could be a... I like it. Uh, Mark, your net connection seems to be a little shaky. Right now, you've you've blurred into a a strange caricature of yourself. Um, but I would love to do that. Anybody want to um, propose some topics for next call? Maybe the next topic should be Tico. Oh God. Yep. Tico in three lines. <laughs> um, I've become interested in April's book about flux. Um, do you have you read it? I oh I've read it. Who who here has read it? Anybody? Stacy just got it from the library. I know that. Okay. I am in the process of reading it, and I really love it. And I don't usually sit down to read, so this is enjoyable. Cool. It's a high bar. Yes. Um. Cool, and um, um, I could invite April to one of our calls or like next Thursday maybe, or I could represent for her because I've read it a few times, I would say, and I'm in one of the chapters. One of her superpowers is uh, start with trust, which is based on a lot of the work that I've been doing on trust. Um, and there they are from the notes that Pete just showed. Yep. I say this with all due respect, but you can substitute for April. What? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna remember that, Stacey. <laughs> um, there, was, there were some things in the introduction that just hit home and uh-oh, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> yeah, you know. I think cool. if we invited April in, I'd love a chance to read the book a bit before, at least a bit, you know, before we have that conversation. I think that would be fun. So for so me, not, I prefer not to do it next, next time week. and maybe right. the time after with a little mm. forewarning, that'd be nice. That sounds cool. And that also, April's got way too many engagements right now. She's like booked wall to wall. 
Uh, so, you know, having her show up on a Thursday call will take a, a little bit of wrangling, but, uh, but that'll buy us time to read the book. Other topics that matter to, to people, I'm, yeah. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't Glenn, mind, please. I wouldn't mind talking a little bit about metaverse, you know, if, if, especially if Pete, you're looking at putting a project together, maybe we spend some time talking about what we're seeing, what we're reading, putting, putting articles and things that we know about in the, in the chat stream and start to organize the, organize it together. It's just a thought. I like that idea a lot. Pete? That sounds great. Yeah. I like that idea a whole bunch. And, and I, one of the articles I, I, I've got in my list now it's in tabs or something like that, but it's, it's about here's the right way to do a metaverse. Um, so I, it's, it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting happenstance, uh, kind of like COVID happening <laughs> or, or something like that. It's like, uh, okay, so some billionaire, some multi-billionaire decided he's going to drop $10 billion on this thing that he's going to screw up. So now we have to kind of gather around and, and teach people, you know, what um, it really means. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the valence he's stealing, um, and, uh, and the right way to do it as opposed to the Facebook way to do it. Do you, um, do you envision in my head, I'm already envisioning it would be the same structure as what you just put together for the OGM call from last week. Yeah. Is that much. what you're picturing too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Makes um, sense. And I'm, I've been pondering doing a short medium post or something like that about this metaverse thing uh, with a bunch of, of thoughts. And also the idea that the metaverse I would like to inhabit, let's pretend Zuckerberg hadn't said all these things and talked about the metaverse so much. So let's try to rewind your brains to the, the pure metaverse pre uh, the owning. Um, it looks a lot like where OGM is aiming. That, that, that uh, a little avatar world where you can buy the sweater that that lady's walking by with is not a world I wanna inhabit, but a place where we can share what we know uh, and curate it so that it better represents what we need to do next and why and uh, whatever else I, is actually a, a, a thing I'm apparently devoting a whole bunch of my life energy to. So I'm trying to figure out how to communicate that properly in an article that says there is the possibility of a really interesting metaverse out there. It's just not the one that Zuckerberg painted, right? It has it has astonishingly little resonance and relate and, and resemblance to the one that uh, Zuckerberg painted, which is uh, dangerous, boring, and cumbersome. So. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. So topic chosen. We're, we're going to talk next week about the metaverse. I love it. And this gives us some incentive to pre-pack whatever it is we want to do about the topic. So let's, let's post that on the OGM calls um, channel on Mattermost so that we, like everybody knows, and then let's offer up uh, riffs, connections, screen shares, whatever anybody wants to do on the topic for this. Reading, and if I'm, list. Uh, reading lists. And if I'm if I'm uh, lucky, I will um, I will have uh, written the post I just talked about. Uh, and also, let me just um, share screen here to the thought uh, in my brain. So I'm I'm collecting up a bunch of uh, reviews, articles, critiques of this. So I've got Zuckerberg declares the metaverse opposite to Facebook papers, which is you know the bad month to be uh, another bad month to be Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, and then uh, the meta, the renaming, uh, the rebranding of the Facebook umbrella organization to Meta, et cetera, uh, and other kinds of things there. So I'll, I'll post a link to this nexus uh, in the chat. Um, like this. Um, cool. Any other thoughts? Any or any any closing thoughts? Um, for today or reflections on, were we too geeky today? Was this an okay check-in call? I mean, I feel like we saw a lot of stuff that we don't normally get to see and that it was geeky because we saw geeky sort of stuff, which was cool. Uh, but I think maybe some people who like to come in and just hearing what people are up to, uh, it might've been a little too much geek factor, but other thoughts? I don't mind. I think that's important to let it go go in which direction it, um i appreciate that it didn't dominate the entire 90 minutes you know but 
I appreciate hearing it because conceptually everything weaves together. So, and I, even though Eric, uh, you know, I don't live in that world and, but I completely understood what you were doing. Right. And, and, and appreciated particularly this, you know, the fact that the Z axis exists and the filtering exists. And I, I get where that goes. So even though I can't live in that world with you, I completely appreciate the work that you're doing and how you're thinking it through. And, and, and that's exciting. So I think it all has a, has a piece in the puzzle and, and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Love that. Um, and, and also um, just to riff on that, one of the things I'm trying to figure out how to explain or how to steer toward is the idea of like a view master kind of uh, app where as you click on the view master, the way you look at the same sort of data changes and you can, you can then choose and zigzag and, and Eric, your demo of zigzag was awesome. I've never seen it demoed that nicely. Um, and that the zigzag is a particular way of walking through data you know, through paths and dimensions. And that means you have to declare dimensions and make those links, but it's really rich. A different way of, of viewing the world might be, you know, uh, the, the web diagram that Pete was demonstrating that Obsidian can generate. And then a different one is something else. And finding your way to the right, and a different one would be 3D objects in space, which Julian's working on. And how to find your way to the best representation for the moment, I think is a really interesting question. Like, how do we pick our way through? How do we become aware of the varieties of representation? Because lots of people specialize or they find one they like and they get hooked on that and they're kind of done. And they're not aware of a lot of the other ways of walking through data and, and, and information. And, and Mark, what you said about sort of where the archive is heading about, hey, how do we add value to the information? How do we make it more accessible in different ways instead of just storing it? That's really, really interesting here. And for me, the, the, like the view master is a really primitive uh, metaphor to say, uh, what if there was a frame within which applications played nicely, and then you could start to choose and pick and navigate which way you go. You know, so I, was gonna I know I haven't in, been able to... I was gonna kick in here, Sorry. the modern equivalent of that would be Google Cardboard. If anybody yeah, needs one, a couple dozen sitting in a box, um, the advantage of a Google Cardboard over a ViewMaster is that the ViewMasters were taken from a fixed viewpoint and the cardboards are interactive. Remember uh, some months ago, I showed my 3D knowledge navigator. And in fact, if you're viewing that on a cardboard, when you, have, when you tap on the screen, it actually means move to the node that I'm looking at currently. So, uh, because uh, you, you can, of course, move your head around with a cardboard, right? And it looks around different places in the network but that was the one navigation mechanism I was able to come up with quickly. And again, if anybody needs a Google Cardboard, I'll send you one because I've got a carton full of them. Sweet. Um, and and um, Julian, um, I totally realized the weaknesses of the ViewMaster analogy. It's just that every, almost everybody used a ViewMaster as a child at some point or found one in the, in the attic or something like that. So it's a really common thing. And not that many people know what a Google Cardboard is. So oh, it's-, it's yeah, there's some in my library. I've got a bunch yeah, of those. Yeah. I've got a couple in my drawer assembled and just sitting there going, why does nobody use me? Um, Wendy. I'd love one. <laughs> I think that would be cool. Thank you, awesome. Julian. Um, yeah, and, and to me, this is exactly what I've been picturing too in terms of the visual, right? We need some sort of standard visual that really rests on the decentralized web in the sense that, you know, apps can... It, or it can be an app in which the data comes in from all over, but then has some sort of standardized viewing capability, right? So that we can start to make sense of this and we're not having to learn different software all the time. Oh, uh, one thing I should mention is that the ViewMaster company themselves did it in a uh, cardboard app some years ago. I think it's discontinued now. Love that. Um, so that's kind of where we're aiming. I mean, that's that's um, a piece of how we're trying to work our way through this thing. So, um, so we have a topic for next week. We had a lovely call, <laughs> and Michael is holding up a damn ViewMaster. <laughs> well done, well done, Michael. Thank you. I, I'm feeling some nostalgia at the moment. Yeah. Uh, does everybody know what the term nostalgia means? Yeah. Oops, uh, damn you autocorrect in Zoom chat. So um, nostalgia is what East Germans felt after the fall of the wall, when some of them were like, damn, I kind of miss the old crappy times in the DDR. 
because they, they used to call Ost as East in German. And so Ostalgie, Ostalgie is actually the, the German word, uh, is what they called their nostalgia for the, the previous times before capitalism had eaten, had eaten their world entirely. Uh, and if you haven't seen the movie Goodbye Lenin, uh, highly, have it, has anybody watched Goodbye Lenin? Only one of us, okay. Uh, premise, premise is uh, this, young, this young, very sweet guy's mom has been in a coma for a while. Uh, and so, sorry, she goes into a coma. She's very, very sick. She slips into a coma right as the wall falls. And then she wakes up and the wall is down and everybody's in the streets and everybody got rid of their old DDR furniture and they're running around. And the doctor says to this young guy, uh, if your mom has a big shock of the system, she might die. You can't let her know that the wall has fallen, that the DDR is gone. So he proceeds to reenact the DDR and he convinces his friends to come in and do stuff. He then, and sorry for the plot spoiler, but it's so cute. He then reenacts the TV newscasts that the DDR was known for and all of that. It's all in Goodbye Lenin. It's a lovely movie. And hilarious. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's really well, like the premise is good, is really good. And the, the, the actual work of the, of the movie is excellent. Uh, also, there's a, a series called The Movies That Made Us that is the backstory behind a lot of famous movies that I just sort of watched a bit of, like at night to get sleep. It's really excellent. Um, with that, off to our days. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thanks for co-thinking and co-being. <laughs>